Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars, presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will explore the leadership, tireless support, and effectiveness of Governor Samuel Kirkwood during the larger story of Iowa's role in the American Civil War. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Byer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation, but please note we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Victoria Bryant-Stewart. Dr. Stewart is an Associate Professor of History at Northwest Florida State College. She attended St. Xavier University for her BA in History and Political Science. She then went on to earn an MA in American History from Western Illinois University and an MA in Political Science and a PhD in History from Northern Illinois University. Dr. Stewart received research grant funding through the State Historical Society of Iowa to write about the assassination of two provost marshals that had been killed while enforcing the draft during the American Civil War. Additionally, she's been funded for this current research project on Governor Samuel Kirkwood, which is the subject of today's lecture. Given her research interest, Dr. Stewart enjoys researching the interplay of state, local, and federal governments. She has also conducted research on Governor John Milton of Florida and has begun research on Governor Thomas Moore of Louisiana. The Center for Southeast, Southeast Louisiana Studies and Archives has funded and named Dr. Stewart the J. Y. Sanders Scholar of 2003-2004 for her research project on Governor Moore. Dr. Stewart receives the Excellent in Teaching Award from the National Society of Leadership and Success after being nominated by her students in 2020. She was further recognized by her peers in August of 2022 and received the Excellence in Teaching Award um, from Northwest Florida State College. Her areas of interest in research revolve around civil violence, freedom of speech, conscript conscription, law and society studies, and military history. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Dr. Stewart to begin the webinar. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this lecture. I wanted to thank those at the State Historical Society of Iowa for inviting me to speak today. I especially wanted to thank Jennifer Cooley for all her work in putting this together and her guidance through this process as I put together this presentation. This presentation is part of a larger project that I've begun working on regarding Governor Kirkwood. I'm grateful for the financial support for this research from the State Historical Society of Iowa and appreciate their constant efforts regarding historical knowledge and preservation. As someone with an interest in both history and political science, this research allows me to mix methods to survey the role of this state level executive and his relationship with the federal government. This research allows me to look at a special case with very close attention to one man's actions and how those actions had a profound and significant impact on the state of Iowa and a broader impact on the union and American history. Following the initial excitement and fervor to enlist in the military during the American Civil War, enlistments waned and recruitment efforts sought to compensate for low troop enrollment. The militaries of both the Confederacy and the Union used conscripted men to fill their ranks, first used in 1862 in the Confederacy, and then in 1863 in the Union, conscription remained a universally detested policy for both militaries. 
Additionally important, anti-war protest and dissent raged through the North and South as the war continued. Governors served as these essential actors to enforce conscription policies and mitigate dissent in their states. These state level executives became localized extensions to enforce federal policies. Governor Samuel Kirkwood, ever steadfast and strongly committed to the union, effectively used his position to aid the union's cause, protect his constituents, stand strong amid protest and strife, and effectively lead during a time of crisis and chaos. Like other state level executives, Kirkwood faced challenges dealing with troop enrollment and equipment of those troops and also enforcing law and order in dealing with internal threats of violence and dissent while addressing or meeting his obligations to the federal government. Governor Kirkwood made difficult decisions to address heightened tensions and new expectations placed upon him. State management and executive powers for these governors tested their resolve to address the immediate needs of their constituents while further serving their wider commitments to the federal leadership and its military. These men sought advice and assistance that made the tough choices with their central goal at the forefront of their decision making. Safety and stability, the core principles of their decision making, enabled Governor Kirkwood to serve during a time of domestic crisis and immense external pressure. As chief arbiters at the state level, these executives experienced the duality of the American Civil War to ensure law and order domestically, while they also served their federal obligations to temper the national crisis. When faced with danger and harm, Governor Kirkwood was, as quoted, utterly fearless, although apparently in imminent danger from the rough crowd that surrounded and threatened at times to hang him hissing and howling curses at him, which however failed to interrupt his speech. This article written in 1909 described Kirkwood as a steadfast leader during crisis as he exhibited no fear when directly challenged. Other than biographical reflections, accounts of his statue and his official painting, samples of Kirkwood's papers and letters, Kirkwood's obituary even, Articles upon Kirkwood remain largely absent from such publications as the Annals of Iowa. As someone with an interest in the interplay of local, state, and federal responsibilities and power, Kirkwood is an obvious subject for me to use as the focus of a close examination and inquiry. At the outset of the American Civil War, leadership and crisis management were paramount at different government levels to address the crisis. State level executives such as Kirkwood became essential arms of enforcement and support for the federal government. Federal policies, often unpopular, placed these governors in difficult positions between unhappy or disgruntled constituents and a demanding federal government. As you'll see here, Kirkwood is an example of a strong state level executive often deferring to the federal government, always ever willing to provide a strong hand of support for the union. For Kirkwood, the union's cause was worthy of his loyalty and devotion, despite all the danger he faced while in office. Despite this lengthy resume of service, little is written about Kirkwood in isolation, often written about as a collective of actors, Scholars addressed the working relationship of President Abraham Lincoln with the Union state governors. While it's important to address Lincoln's important relationship to these state governors, writing about the governors as a collective group allows each governor to be eclipsed by all others. This is exactly what happened to Kirkwood. He's been eclipsed. While other governors questioned Lincoln and his policies, Kirkwood stood firm and lockstep with President Lincoln. While other governors openly defied Lincoln and his wartime policies, Kirkwood sought federal assistance to enforce federal policies. Due to his devotion and dedication to the Union, Kirkwood 
should stand recognized for his decisive leadership in times of crisis to deal with internal and external pressures. In his assessment of the interaction of the governors and President Abraham Lincoln, William Hessline argued that Lincoln focused on the nationalization of the Union at the expense of the individual Union states. While not clear of Lincoln's overt or even accidental nationalization, Hessline focused on the wider competition among the Union governors at a time when Lincoln needed cohesion and cooperation across all Union states. For Hessline, he does not argue of the importance of the governors to, he does argue of the importance of the governors to get Lincoln elected, but he's rather critical of their wider role during the Civil War to impact policy as they, in his view, merely served as recruitment agents for the Union military by 1862 and beyond. In this rather negative assessment, Hessline makes the argument that this collection of state level executives could not match Lincoln in regard to his effectiveness, nor served as a strong support for his administration in the remaining years of the conflict. William C. Harris provides a new glimpse into the importance of all executives, so the state level governors and the federal level executive as seen in Abraham Lincoln. In this view, federalism in the Union was a central cornerstone to Lincoln's effectiveness. For Harris, these governors served as extensions beyond the help and assistance of Lincoln, having received from military commanders, members of the Congress, and even his own cabinet. In highlighting the importance of the governors, Harris argues for their relevance, importance, and significance of these governors for the cohesion of local, state, and federal government functionality through the unification of political, and military goals among all Union states. Through this local leadership, governors suppressed dissent, dealt with Native American issues, addressed internal issues with their state legislatures, and even combated negative or dangerous press coverage. Much like Harris's positive assessment of the governors, Stephen Engel further makes the case for the importance of their role for the Union victory. Given the changes to federalism and the changing strength and size of the federal government, Engel argues that Lincoln needed to rely on this group of state level executives to mobilize for the war effort and sustain and support the Union wartime efforts overall. As explained later in this talk about the changing role of governors amid changes to federal laws, governors needed to raise and support soldiers from their states while providing the political and economic support for the war amid dissent and growing dissatisfaction as the war continued. Local opposition and violent dissent, as Engel argues, shows the importance of these state level executives to deal with crisis management and secure order for the overall success of the union. In a similar argument to Harris, this network was a collaborative team of executives. This showed the effectiveness of federalism to deal with crisis throughout local, state, and federal contexts. As we see here, these works give us a glimpse of the collective group of the elected officials tasked with the difficult day-to-day -day administration of law and order during a civil war. These men representing different states and from different political parties often put their differences aside for the greater good and overall health of the Union. I bring up these works as an example of the basis or the foundation of the literature of state level executives. While I find value in these works of these scholars and historians, I further understand the importance of a focused or close study of Kirkwood in isolation to highlight his own decision making, his own influences, and his own specific role to aid the war effort. Kirkwood remains an example of effective leadership to seek advice when necessary, exercise caution when warranted, and remain a firm leader during a period of great upheaval. This project on Kirkwood fills the gaps of these existing literatures to elevate Kirkwood to the level of other figures of his time. 
Rather than remain within the scholarship as just another union governor of this period, Kirkwood deserves the attention of a solitary or focused study of examination. Kirkwood, long-standing, dedicated public servant that he was, should be recognized for his ability to galvanize Iowans to meet and exceed expectations of service during the Civil War. As a decisive leader in a time of crisis and emergency, Kirkwood's steadfast hand calmed fears of unrest. Moreover, he had a keen awareness and understanding of his constituents' needs and he exhibited a steadfast support of the Union. These traits enabled Kirkwood to rise to this moment, to effectively lead. Rather than simply speak of patriotism, as shown in his financial gesture of support to mortgage his own home, and his personal financial support of Iowa's first regiment, Kirkwood embodied patriotism in his actions and deeds. The great war governor, as he's since been called, roused up the troops to risk life and limb to serve Iowa and the Union. Noticeably absent from existing historiography, Kirkwood's contributions and leadership during this tenuous time have not been fully addressed by scholars. Iowa's greatest champion during the war deserves this exploration and attention. The Great War Governor, as mentioned, has been overlooked by scholars, needs to be acknowledged for his public service, his efforts to continually arm and fully equip Iowa's forces, and his attention to maintain law and order amid threats of unrest. I will not spend an exhaustive amount of time on Kirkwood's biography, but I feel his background gives us a better understanding of his influences, a deeper understanding of his decision making process, and his deep respect and reverence to the Union. Born on December 20th, 1813, Kirkwood had an unlikely ascendance into politics. His early life was dedicated to teaching, the law as a prosecuting attorney, and then he operated a milling business. He also spent time in Washington, D.C. in his early life. After moving to Iowa from Ohio in 1855, Kirkwood served in the Iowa State Senate from 1856 to 1859. He won the 1859 Republican gubernatorial nomination and was sworn in as Iowa's fifth governor in January of 1861. So just weeks into his tenure as governor, Kirkwood soon faced the immediacy of the American Civil War. Many credit Kirkwood's strong support of the Republican Party to its success in Iowa at that time. He had been an anti-slavery advocate, which resonated with others in the Republican Party. Many believe his vocal support of the Republican Party in the early months of 1856 secured his name, reputation, and support of this political party. Aside from his most noted career achievements and appointments, Kirkwood also served as a clerk at a drugstore, delegate for Ohio's state constitutional convention and declined to be the U.S. minister to Denmark. While Kirkwood had a career before and after the American Civil War, his connection to the conflict and his decisive role as the executive of Iowa during the war cement his connection to this historical moment. It is worth noting that he also served as Iowa's ninth governor after filling a vacancy in the U.S. Senate between January 1866 and March 1867. In 1875, he was reelected to his third term as governor and resigned a little after a year into that term for a seat in the U.S. Senate between March 1877 and March 1881, when he resigned to accept a cabinet appointment in President Garfield's administration as Secretary of the Interior where he remained until his resignation in 1882. On a personal level, as you see pictured here, Kirkwood married Jane Clark once he worked and engaged in business with the Clark and Lucas families in milling and land speculation.
So Iowa, like other states in the union, had an early strong outpouring of support for the war. Upon review of the 1860 census and the enrollment numbers of Iowans during the American Civil War, sources indicate that Iowa had the highest number of men serving in the North or South during the war. Iowa famously supplied the Greybeard Regiment, which consisted solely of men beyond the age of 45. These men served in many important roles. They escorted trains, guarded railroad cars and supplies, and guarded over 160,000 prisoners. The Greybeard Regiment, the only of its kind in any Union state, illustrated the dedication of Iowans that even exceeded the average age of those in service. Iowa supplied 48 infantry regiments, nine cavalry regiments, four batteries of artillery to the Union Army. While in service, Iowans suffered 13,000 deaths from disease and battle casualties. Another 8,500 men were wounded in battle. In receiving 27 Congressional Medals of Honor, Iowans in service demonstrated their bravery and valor in battle. According to estimates by the US War Department, while it used the Militia Act of 1862, so this was the precursor to the Enrollment Act of 1863, when the Militia Act was used to muster men into service, of the 300,000 men called for, only about 87,000 were credited as having been drafted into service under this call. This number, as reports indicate, was much reduced by desertion before the men could be got out of their respective states. By the spring of 1863, after months of effort to increase the size of the military, federal conscription was implemented through the Enrollment Act to create a new system of manpower procurement to secure the size of the Union military. Conscription, an unpopular military policy, increased tensions and violence in the Union. Many communities, including communities in Iowa, responded violently when conscription calls attempted to enroll men into service from their communities. While intended to create a streamlined process to muster men directly into the Union military, its critics highlighted that the expense of the federal government's role to expand to oversee this new system of manpower procurement. Iowa, divided into six districts under this new law, ultimately conscripted men into service with this new federally controlled and maintained system when Iowa's volunteer volunteerism failed to meet their imposed quota. Instances of violence and resistance took place in nearly all districts except District 2. The counties in which we see violent episodes were mostly politically Republican strongholds in federal elections, and it illustrated instances of resistance after Iowa's initial excitement to volunteer and serve had waned after the initial phase of the war. The war quickly changed Iowa. Less than a year into the conflict, the state capital turned into a military station in which many of Iowa's troops moved through on their way to the action. Many of these young men had never seen the state's capital or even their state's governor before. Given his background, Kirkwood easily connected and communicated with the state's farmers as they soon entered the fray to defend the Union in uniform. He fostered relationships with Iowa's troops, often visiting camps, and reassured them that he had their best interests at the heart as, his, as their governor. Their welfare, he assured them, was at the forefront of his agenda as the state's executive. Kirkwood's own nephew, Samuel Kirkwood Clark, joined the cavalry in the early phases of the war. Even after his promotion to lieutenant, Governor Kirkwood advised this young service member in writing. Governor Kirkwood wrote, you must not allow yourself to become proud and overbearing. In short, you must use your influence to see that the right is done at all times and under all circumstances. 
In his own address and remarks to the state's legislature, Kirkwood spoke of a strong union response to ensure the South would never succeed again. Given his background as a conservative man from the frontier, Kirkwood supported a harsh war against the Confederacy. He understood his views on abolition may discourage enlistment and volunteerism. Therefore, he did not make a bold stand in support of abolition at this time. He had no misgivings about the war and their responsibility to engage in the conflict. His strong support for the Union and their mission and responsibility to preserve it was not lost on Kirkwood. While others thought the war would be a quick conflict, Kirkwood predicted that it would be a long and difficult war to wage that would really test their resolve. He informed Iowans of the pending sacrifices that they would face, informing his constituents of the coming burdens and his need for their cooperation, sacrifice, and dedication to the Union and its war effort. Ever aware of the cohesion and the state of affairs in his state, his primary concern as governor was collecting taxes from delinquents to get their financial support for the war in the state. In addition to dealing with the changing and new federal guidelines and expectations for recruitment, and military service, these governors dealt with dire financial situations in their states. Part of the federal obligation under federal conscription in the Union required states to supply the money for enlistment bounties. When Iowa was positioned initially very well for agricultural production, movement of foodstuffs, however, became increasingly difficult down the Mississippi River. In a speech delivered in January of 1862, Governor Kirkwood said, our business operations have been interrupted and our markets have been closed. The prices of the products of our industry have been lessened. Passage was eliminated on the water route and freight rates increased. Taxes became difficult to pay and even more difficult for the state to collect. By the outset of the war, Kirkwood was faced with no available arms and ammunition, no surplus in supplies or uniforms for the enlisted men, and with little options of available money to purchase those supplies or pay those bounties for volunteers as instructed. Given the dire straits of the state, men pledged money, Iowa's banks offered loans, and Kirkwood himself pledged to mortgage his property to borrow money for these needed supplies. While Kirkwood could not bankroll Iowa, this gesture illustrated his personal willingness to show his support for the state during its financial time of need. According to Kirkwood, the state of Indiana represented the base of operations for many members of the Knights of the Golden Circle that had intentions, in his words, to embarrass the government in the prosecution of the war, mainly by encouraging desertions of the army, protecting deserters from arrest, discouraging enlistment, and preparing the public mind for armed resistance against conscription. Other states, including Ohio and Illinois, were plagued by Copperhead activity, and violent resistance to conscription and exhibited coordinated efforts to thwart the Union War's effort. Kirkwood exhibited a keen sense of awareness to take decisive action to try to prevent Copperheads from taking hold in his state. Lawless behavior as exhibited in Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois, in Kirkwood's view, was conceived by, in his words, self-important men of small caliber and small ambition to give themselves local importance and to secure for themselves petty offices and who, if an outbreak were to occur, would not be in the way of danger. Kirkwood, ever vigilant and focused on ensuring law and order in his state, gave orders to move a company to protect Keokuk. 
Governor Kirkwood's prediction of violence was soon seen through a violent episode in Keokuk County. While there are other regions, as he was monitoring, of anti-union sentiment in the state that also pose a threat of violence, the Keokuk regional area bore the conditions for disobedience and disorder. The inhabitants in this area had already participated in demonstrations. These demonstrations consisted of dangerous utterances of disloyal sentiments and statements against the federal government. Governor Kirkwood predicted these tensions, however, but he was unable to completely prevent an escalation, even within the region he identified as a possible site of resistance. Kirkwood authorized arms and men to be sent to the sheriff of Washington County. Kirkwood, in an effort to quell these tensions, traveled to the area and called for Iowans to remain peaceful. This quick and decisive action of Kirkwood was praised by later scholars that argued that his actions, and this is a quote, prevented a bloody conflict and was an unmistakable warning to the lawless element that the military power of the state would be used to suppress any mob violence. Despite this instance of violence, it did not pose a significant threat to impede the operation of the war effort, the union policies, the union military, Iowa state militia, or even Kirkwood's leadership and decision-making. Republicans argued that the Congress, through this new proposed federal plan and system of federal conscription, had the power to employ various means to wage the war. Democrats, on the other hand, believe Congress had the ability to raise and supply armies as granted by powers in the Constitution, but only by using existing methods of manpower procurement, so those that existed before the war. The Enrollment Act of 1863 and its subsequent amendments even included provisions to revoke a man's citizenship for noncompliance. With the changes following the passage of the Enrollment Act, governors were not as involved in the enrollment process. Under previous laws and regulations, governors ensured that the state met their mandated quotas for enrollment purposes. Quotas were based on a state's population. With the new federal system of conscription, federal agents were appointed, mostly for political purposes or reasons, within military districts as drawn by the federal government within each state. Provost marshals were tasked with selecting eligible men in their assigned districts and arresting deserters. And because of this action, they became the main targets of violence. These officers, many killed while performing their duty of arresting deserters, became the murdered martyrs of enforcement of the Enrollment Act. During the course of the war, 38 enrollment personnel were killed in the Union while performing their assigned duties. Aside from their often political appointments, provost marshals also received the rank of captain, which angered the draft eligible men for receiving such a rank because many did not have prior military experience. Conscription touched communities in the North and South by requiring men to leave their homes for a term of mandatory military service. Conscription laws privileged some men at the expense of others. During the Civil War, fostering a substitute, paying the commutation fee, and obtaining medical exemptions allowed men to evade service but not all men were able to secure one of these financial means to avoid service. These and other reasons of resistance occurred because conscription raised fundamental questions about the obligation of military service in the Republic, introduced central questions about how citizenship would be conceived, and further caused concern of how conscription laws would be realized. After the Civil War, conscription policies were altered in an attempt to eliminate resistance, yet resistance still occurred. Important alterations took place following the lessons learned during the war. As an example, local boards would be staffed with civilians rather than military personnel. Self-registration additionally placed a responsibility upon men to register themselves for service. 
In August of 1865, Acting Assistant Provost Marshal General, Brevet Brigadier General James Oakes, wrote a detailed report regarding the Union's conscription policies. Oakes argued that the service to the state is a requirement, since it was, in his words, the indisputable right of the government in time of war to secure the services of its citizens' soldiery. However, the system needed to be a system, in Oakes's view, of impartial fairness, simplicity, and economy. Federally controlled conscription illustrates a significant shift in American understandings of personal liberty, requirements of service and military obligation in times of national emergency, and the growing power of the federal government to oversee this system of manpower procurement. Leaving their families, their livelihoods, and the safety of their homes to run into the hellfire of battle, meeting unbelievable challenges with bravery, skill, and honor, meeting and exceeding expectations given to them to fight this war. Those in service, those asked to serve, and their honorable service rendered is a constant reminder of the challenges America has faced. Whether they enlisted or were drafted, these men and the families and friends they left to serve remain a constant reminder of service demanded and service given. Days after the passage of the Enrollment Act, Governor Kirkwood wrote to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to inform him of his concerns. In his view, an immediate and strong response to disobedience would keep the peace and discourage further lawlessness. In a statement of foreshadowing of imminent danger in Iowa, Kirkwood believed in the value of his state guard. According to Kirkwood, if a draft shall be ordered in this state, it will be necessary. For Kirkwood, local defense was his top priority to deal with pending threats. Kirkwood was advised against a heavy-handed response, but disregarded this advice. Kirkwood's primary concern revolved around the safety of enrollment personnel to execute their duty to enforce conscription. For the remainder of that year, Kirkwood worked with federal and state agents to provide additional security and remain aware of pending threats of violence. As with the other governors in the Union, Kirkwood also faced these issues of enrollment and proper armament of the enrolled troops. While Kirkwood may have had every intention to meet his obligations, he knew Southern Iowa posed a significant threat to the operation of conscription and even the collection of taxes. In Kirkwood's own words, he expressed his intention to employ, as he said, every nerve to provide safety and ensure the success of enrollment in his state. Kirkwood, similarly to the other union governors, used incentives to make appeals to his constituents. They appealed to local and state pride of their people. Since conscription was detested and unpopular, governors also made an effort to appeal to remove the negative stigma and shame of conscription. As governor, Kirkwood called a special session of the Iowa General Assembly to allocate funding and welfare relief to Iowans that were willing and eager to provide local defense to safeguard their local communities. Those willing and eager would receive weapons to provide this home front defense. In another example of his exchange with Secretary Stanton, Kirkwood expressed his concerns of Iowa's western border, given the recent activities of the Yantons and their union with the Sioux. In his words, Kirkwood said, something must be done at once. This is yet another example of how governors shared in the responsibility of state defense and military fronts regarding local defense. Following the draft riots in New York in the summer of 1863, Kirkwood wrote to Stanton again. Kirkwood, nor most of the other Union governors, were not really surprised of the armed and violent opposition to conscription that summer. Kirkwood, like the other governors, closely watched the federal response to this unrest waiting to see their response and reaction to this very violent resistance. As Kirkwood wrote to Stanton, the enforcement of the draft throughout the country depends upon its enforcement in New York City. 
Despite Kirkwood's own efforts of ensuring and providing security in Iowa, Provost Marshal Van Eaton was killed on October 31st, 1863 in Fremont County while carrying out his duties and responsibilities regarding conscription. This event will foreshadow the tragic end of Deputy Provost Marshal John Beshore and Special Agent Josiah Woodruff. Nearly a year after the death of Provost Marshal Van Eaton, Beshore and Woodruff entered Sugar Creek Township in Powshane County and met Mike Gleason on September 30th, 1864. Gleason, a resident of that township, was informed of the officer's business. While the officers tended to their horses and ate a little quick lunch, Gleason notified the other local men of the arrival of the officers and the officers' intentions to arrest Joseph Robertson, Thomas McIntyre, and Samuel A. Bryant, since these men evaded the most recent conscription call. While the total number of men in attendance remains unknown, Newspaper reports indicate that John and Samuel Flenner and Perry McFarland were also present on this day. Concerns of violence and hostility, a continued fear in Iowa materialized when the officers sought to complete their orders to make these arrests. According to the official report written by Captain James Matthews, Bashore and Woodruff were violently accosted 15 miles from Grenell while traveling on the road toward Okaloosa. The officer's carriage approached John and Joe Flenner and Mike Gleason. Beshore left the carriage and informed these men of their duty. Upon realization of the imminent danger, Beshore attempted to get back into the carriage. John Flenner, before Beshore could get to safety, shot Beshore in the back with a double barrel shotgun. According to some reports, Beshore pled and begged for his life immediately before he was struck. Woodruff sustained wounds when struck in the chest with that same double-barreled shotgun. Woodruff was then hit by a bullet in the face and sustained broken bones in his lower jaw. Woodruff was then shot in the head and killed instantly. In an effort to return fire, Beshore shot and severely wounded Gleason's thigh, which made it impossible for Gleason to flee the scene. In rather graphic detail, Matthews describes the attack upon these officers. As noted in the report, Woodruff was killed instantly. His body was found about 20 yards from the road in the bushes, shot in the head till his brains were scattered upon the ground and several holes through his body. Captain Beshore was laying on the road, mortally wounded, shot in the head, through the body, and then beat over the head, as he said, with the butt of the rifle, which lay beside him broken. The captain talked some, was quite sensible, but only lived a short time. Equally troubling, as indicated in the official report, Beshore's last words before death were, tell the captain I died doing my duty. Residents rushed to the scene to assess the situation. They moved Beshore to James Craver's residence to rest comfortably until his death. In a futile attempt to evade punishment, Gleason lied to authorities by stating that he had tried to help the officers. Beshore lingered near death for a few hours following the incident. Therefore, he was able to give his account of the incident to implicate Gleason's role in the ambush. In Beshore's words, Gleason fought us as wickedly as any of them. The Flenners escaped Iowa and lived the rest of their lives under assumed names. According to Captain Matthews, those responsible for this horrific act were, in his words, assassins in a sworn band of no trifling magnitude, confederated together for disloyal purposes, one principal object being forcible resistance to the draft. Weeks after the incident, Provost Marshal General Fry informed Major General John Pope and wrote, these officers had been detailed to arrest certain deserters from the draft in that county and were waylaid and shot without any pretense or provocation except the lawful discharge of their duty. Beshore and Woodruff, agents of enforcement of an unpopular military policy, suffered at the hands of violent dissidents determined to evade military service. Following the murder, great effort was taken to address security concerns and punish those responsible for the murders. 
To give you another example, a glimpse into another state, Iowa also, or Illinois, sorry, suffered from a violent attack upon a provost marshal. Just weeks after Bashor and Woodruff's death in Iowa, William H. Randolph was killed in Illinois. Matilda Randolph, Randolph's wife said, he told me he was not afraid to die. He said he was dying for his country and it was a glorious cause. Randolph was a local Republican politician and businessman, and he too was fatally shot for what he believed to be a noble pursuit of working for the United States government and more importantly, President Lincoln. His early life and its experiences made him a local icon and his dedication to working for the people and for his government ultimately cost him his life. As noted earlier in this discussion, Kirkwood was closely watching neighboring states. He sensed pending danger and the conditions for unrest and uncertainty. And he had a keen understanding of predicting violence, understanding the necessary conditions that would spur men to violent action. And as seen in these instances against enrollment personnel, Kirkwood understood the dangers that they faced. He understood the dangers of their assigned roles of enforcement. And as you have seen in these examples in Iowa, despite his preparedness, despite his efforts to coordinate support to ensure protection, violence still ensued. He stood firm to harness a coordinated effort of force to discourage disobedience. In 1883, roughly 10 years before his death, Kirkwood was asked of his life. Kirkwood said, my life has not been an eventful one at all. And I congratulate myself that I got along through my three score years and 10 as well as I have. My ambition nowadays is to keep my name out of the papers. I do find it interesting that in his remaining years, he wanted to fade into obscurity. This man that had dedicated his life to public service, this man that had shown himself to be a strong, effective leader during times of peace and war, this man that had won elections, that this man wanted to quietly bow out of public life. Equally interesting to me is that he remarked that his life was not an eventful one. After this brief discussion of Kirkwood today, I hope you can see that he did live quite a remarkable life. In 1978, 84 years after his death, the Iowa State Historical Department, Division of the State Historical Society, and the Johnson County Historical Society erected a marker to honor Kirkwood. Located in Coralville at the intersection of 5th Street and 3rd Avenue, this marker summarizes Kirkwood's political career and his impact upon the state of Iowa. As noted on the marker, Kirkwood is the only Iowan to serve as governor, U.S. Senator, and as a cabinet member. He was described as having served as governor with forcefulness and ability. While brief, this marker serves as another commemoration of Kirkwood to preserve a memory of his legacy in Iowa. Standing tall at the National Sanctuary Hall collection in Washington, DC, as you see pictured here, Governor Samuel Kirkwood and his presence among other noted figures illustrates his lasting importance to the nation and to Iowans. According to Herbert V. Hake, and his physical presence was preserved not only in the Yule portrait, but also in this life-size bronze statue in the Capitol at Washington, D.C. In 1864, the old house chamber of the Capitol had been converted into a gallery for statues of distinguished Americans. Each of the state was allotted spaces for two statues. In the fullness of time, the people of Iowa chose James Harlan and Samuel Kirkwood to represent them. Historians research commemorations and the distinct style, character, and meaning of memories of our collective past. Kirkwood's presence in Statuary Hall has a meaningful, important, and significant theme to unpack and understand. Thomas J. Brown addressed historical memory, American Civil War commemoration, nationhood, and remembrances. According to Brown, similar conceptions of nationhood played a crucial role in the making of the Civil War and then in making the Civil War a foundation of American identity. Contemporary society and culture may not attach the same significance to share memory or perhaps to nationhood. 
whatever the future of the past, the best evidence of attitudes towards the continuity of the American experience is likely to be found in the mystic cores of memory emanating from the Civil War. When researching Governor Kirkwood, decades after the conclusion of the American Civil War and decades after his own death, we are left to evaluate and explain his contributions to Iowa state history and his role within the larger context of American history. Brown's work focused specifically on American Civil War commemorations, but it serves as a frame to evaluate Kirkwood and why his likeness is still representative of Iowa in Washington, D.C., at Statuary Hall and elsewhere. These commanding statuary figures bearing the likeness and representing the defining character of this man stand resolute just as Governor Kirkwood stood firm amid unrest, strife, challenge, and uncertainty. As historians, professionals that are dedicated to the preservation of the past, we see creative efforts of commemoration and memory aside from statues and historical markers. While Kirkwood did not define or describe himself as a graduate due to his limited education, Kirkwood Community College and Kirkwood Elementary School bear his name today. Kirkwood having served many roles and having served his community within many capacities during his life, has a long lasting memorial of him through the state that he proudly served. Students at Kirkwood Community College are greeted by a statue on campus that resembles his statue in Washington, DC. It's as if that statue is calling students to service, commitment to their communities, and a fostering and endearing spirit for knowledge. In these stages of his life and career development, Kirkwood maintained his urge to serve his community and usher in positive changes in policies. Since his death, these symbols stand resolute as reminders of this man. As I often tell my own students, historical memory is getting you to think and have a memory for something that you did not personally witness nor live through. So how do we remember Kirkwood? How do we remember that great war governor? Is he remembered as someone dedicated to public service through elected office? Is he remembered as the calm and reassuring executive at the helm during the Civil War? Is he remembered as someone ever willing to support his state and this country at times of peace and war while making those difficult decisions when necessary? Is he remembered as someone dedicated to his community and the preservation of safety of those he was sworn to protect? Even today, we are taking time today to remember and talk about this man. I'm actively researching and interested in this man and his lasting impact decades after his service and death. And again, as I tell my own students, take that time to think deeply about historical memory. Take some time to think about Kirkwood. At this time, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. If you have any time to, uh, if you have questions to ask, please put them in the Q&A. And please note, we may not be able to get to all questions, but let's dig in. Um, our first question is about Kirkwood's early life. So how do you think Kirkwood's early life influenced him as a leader? I think that's a great question. And I think that um, what I've seen in my survey so far is that he really had to um, pull himself up. He had to set himself up, establish himself, you know, get himself on strong footing. And so he knew the work needed. He knew the work needed to, you know, establish himself and, and he knew what was necessary to have a strong rapport with people. Um, I kind of alluded to it very briefly about um, a talk he had given. He was at the mill that day when he gave that talk about the Republican Party and, you know, the, the pillars of the Republican Party. And people immediately noticed that this man was special, you know, that he could speak to something so important, something that he believed in. And I think that's what made him very effective. You know, he was very personable. He wrote to troops, you know, he, he had correspondence with troops that he would communicate with. And I think that made him an effective leader because people could trust him. People felt that he was invested and people felt that he cared about their safety and their well-being and and I mean, he's going to mortgage his own home, you know, for the financial solvency of the state. I mean, him, you know, just 
not saying the things that are important, but embodying what it meant to be, you know, patriotic, what it meant to, to save the union and, you know, him really um, being an example for people to look to. So I think that's a, a great question. And I think he really embodied, you know, what it meant to be an effective leader, you know, to stand up. And I, I alluded to one of his speeches where, you know, he was being chastised and him standing firm, delivering that speech and, and not backing down. I mean, people, you know, were receptive of that. And, and I think that is what we still see today. You know, I mean, look at this statue of him. I mean, it, it's supposed to show him being very strong and um, being very forceful in that role. And I think that that's what we still remember about him today. Our next question is a two-part question. I'll ask both questions here. How did Kirkwood's anti-slavery ideas form? Uh, and the second part of that question is, was Kirkwood always against slavery and the racist ideology that upheld it? That's a great question, too. Um, as far as I know, um, you know, he had those ideas when he was living in Ohio and part of the um, delegation for their state constitution, which I found incredibly interesting that he was politically involved in that way. And I think for him, you know, he held those beliefs. He really believed in equality. I didn't speak to it much here, but uh, he wanted to raise, um, you know, troops, um, African-American troops. He, he was very invested in um, having them participate. He felt that they should be treated and paid as, as others um, would, you know, in service. And so he felt that there should be equality. He felt that there should be no difference, that there really should be um, this effort to be inclusive. And he knew that that was controversial. And so, I, I mean, I guess this kind of dovetails with the first question about leadership. So um, he held these beliefs and he did the motions. I mean, there were efforts to raise um, African-American units in Iowa that he was involved in, but he also didn't want to um, speak too openly to try to discourage other participation. But I mean, I think it's something that he saw early on in his life, kind of this effort to be um, inclusive, to be um, egalitarian. And it's something that he holds for the rest of his life, kind of these efforts for um, freedom. And I think that was um, very powerful to read about him. And, and he writes about these things very um, very importantly as as a theme for him in his life it's a great question we're running up to the hour so this will be our last question but i want to ask a little bit about you yourself how did you become interested in studying the local aspects related to the civil war sure um i have been studying the civil war since i was a graduate student so i've studied it far too long i probably many would, many would argue but um i think for me i had always studied the perspective of the the drafted man which is why I know a lot about how the system worked and um, kind of how, how it operated and things like that. But then when I started studying political science, I always found then um, the perspective of the government being really interesting because I had already studied the perspective of the draft eligible. So then in using political science, I'm like, well, let's look at government enforcement, right? So then I kind of merged these two fields of study together. And I think that's why a lot of people um, like this work because it mixes methods between political science history. It, it allows us to have a deeper kind of understanding of application, right? Different perspectives and, and how the law works, right? From either the enforcement of it or the disobedience to it. So I hope this um, presentation kind of showed um, how that works. And as far as Iowa is concerned, I mean, um, I knew about the um, provost marshals and um, how they were very violently murdered. And, and for me, I was very interested in, in that. And that's how I wanted to look at what the governor was doing, what local leadership was doing. And um, that's how I got interested in, in looking at Kirkwood specifically and if he knew kind of what was happening on the ground. And he was. <laughs> he was very involved, as, as we saw today. That's great. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you to everyone joining us today. And we'd like to extend one last thank you to presenter Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much. We sure. hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. 
There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months, and we hope you can join us. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, or to watch recordings of past programs, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. While you are there, you can look into some other of our fantastic programs, such as our Goldie's Kids Club activities, Young Historians, and much more. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on June 8th, same time, same place. Thank you all for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.